Hi everybody, it's great to have you here for this next Inspiring Minds se uh, session, which is on crisis management. Before we get started, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping, which is to remind you of our Twitter handle, which is marketing so sock school, <coughs> marketing S O C S C O, and the hashtag Inspiring Minds. So um, I also just want to remind you that there's a Q&A and a chat function which you can ask us questions as you go along. We'll try and answer those and if we haven't answered them during the session, we'll try and recap some at the end. And just to a uh, reminder that the session is being recorded and will be available later on the Marketing Society website. So first of all, I want to introduce you to our fabulous speakers that we've got with us today. Um, the astute amongst you will realise that the first speaker is a colleague of mine, which is Juliet Simpson, CEO of Stripe Communications. Um, Juliet founded Stripe 13 years ago and has successfully grown the agency into um, one of the UK's leading consultancies. Um, uh, with a mix of clients across the public and private sector and a plethora of awards, including the CIPR Consultancy of the Year in 2014 and 16. This is a bit weird, introducing my own agency. Um, she's handled a few crises in her time and she's a fellow of the Marketing Society. Welcome, Juliet. Also, we've got um, Andrew Wilson, who is a founding partner of Charlotte Street Partners. Andrew's an economist and um, has significant experience of publicly listed and private businesses, the third sector work and public service. He specialises in economics and public policy especially on the Scottish economy and the implications of potential independence. Welcome, Andrew. And finally, we have Derek Hempel, a Senior Marketing Manager with the Royal Bank of Scotland. Over the last 10 years, Derek has played a key role in helping launch and grow <coughs> that rest in Royal Bank of Scotland brands on social. And as, a, and as digital content lead, he ensures the digital content strategy aligns with the wider marketing objectives um, delivering innovative content to drive customer engagement. Welcome, Ad, uh, Derek. Thank you. So, despite the fact that we're in the middle of this huge crisis, um, from a comms point of view, it's actually been relatively straightforward. The government has led the way and businesses have followed. Um, no one is in the loom, we're all knit together and it's made it a relatively easy message for us to deal with. But um, as we see the transition uh, today and um, appropriately with Nicola Sturgeon just announcing her roadmap and we move back into the next normal which I've blatantly stolen from Andrew Wilson instead of new normal it's the next normal um, businesses will have to be prepared for managing their own news and reputations as the news outlets and media move from following the government into um, looking for stories around the social and economic fallout. So that could be anything from financial struggles, redundancies, postponed investment, employee relations or additional spikes in infection. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that will be unavoidable, but brands will be held accountable for their actions during this time. So together, the panel have put together some key themes that they're going to take you through today. And they will cover off preparing for and managing a crisis, protecting reputation, business agility and recovery and finally innovation. So without further ado, let's get started. I've worked in columns for about 20 something years and I don't think I've ever had a um, global pandemic and national lockdown on a risk register that I've done for a client. Um, but here we are. Um, what can a business do to prepare for a crisis? And equally, how does a business know when an issue that's been rumbling on starts to become a crisis? Well, I'd say from my perspective, um, <clears throat> it's not really about having a crystal ball to say here are 15 things that could happen to us because almost by definition, sometimes you can't predict it. Although it ha has, happens to be the case that a pandemic should have been on all of our risk registers because they've already had them, many of them over history and some of them much bigger in scale than this one. However, what's important for companies in my experience and I worked at RBS before before Derek during the um, during the car crash that was the period uh, of the financial crisis, and, and the most important thing from a comms perspective is um, obviously you have processes and you can practice, but but there's no theory or practice that beats you know street wisdom and actually having gone through it. And what works then, how you can prepare, is to have you know, short lines of communications to the the board, the chief exec of companies, the leadership of an organisation. So the biggest thing comms and marketing can do to prepare for a crisis 
is be taken seriously by everyone at the top of the company to establish themselves as the, you know, the, the, the most senior bit <clears throat> in, in the board and the executive of the company. That's hugely important. The, the second thing in terms of preparation is just knowing how you will work when it happens. And I think that's to your point there, Mona, the most difficult thing in my experience is calling it. You know, when something's rumbling on, you actually say, you know, this is now so serious, we're going to put into play our processes or there's a crisis. So chief exec, you need to be on the end of the phone every minute or, 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 or whatever. And that's really difficult because quite often you'll, you'll begin to find out from social media now when customers are complaining about a thing, whether it's a collapse of IT, which is a very common crisis for companies at the moment. The people who are inside and maybe responsible for that are in the, are in the business of covering their own back. Mm. And so they'll be in denial. And so there's a tension there that's really, really important. And that's, that's, that's a big one to think about. Um, and then, then as you go through, it's really the agility, um, the preparation for agility to know, you know, who you're going to put up to talk for the company. Are they, are they good enough? You know, plan it out a bit, which we can come on to talk about, you know, think about what the different phases of the crisis might be. And after calling the crisis, the second hardest bit is to call when you're getting through the, the bottom, pardon the expression, but so calling bottom. Now we can begin to talk about, uh, you know, coming out the other side. And right now we're, we're, we're still in the, we're still in that phase of this pandemic here. So there's lots to think about there, I think. So preparation wise is get positioned at the top of the company, be taken seriously, establish your credibility, and then prep, you know, plan a bit, prepare a bit as best you can. Back in the day at RBS, we did this um, once, twice a year, we'd have a full scale exercise. Obviously a huge organization, small companies can't do that to the same extent. But then we went through real, you know, 77 bombings, if you remember in London, 2005, we had about 80,000 people positioned within a mile radius of the bombs. Um, and that was before the financial crisis that hits in 2008 and becomes real. The month it hit that company, there was a hostage crisis affecting staff in Mumbai. And then, of course, through the crisis itself, there were multiple crises at once. And I think for companies now in this moment, there's going to be multiple crises, um, smaller fires as, as the big global one rages. There'll be lots of smaller ones, as you were alluding to in your opening remarks. And so we need to think about that too. And I guess finally in prep, um, marketing, and this is obviously playing to the audience of the Marketing Society, but marketing and comms need to be lockstep. You know, we can't be saying one thing to customers promotionally over here and other things to colleagues or other things to the media. So it's really important that they work together. So I suppose part of that um, key planning process as well will be understanding your audiences, where you are in that journey and, and knowing what, who you're speaking to and what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that most people don't realise is actually you've got multiple audiences that you need to talk to. And actually all of those audiences has a different driver. They want to hear something different and often they want to hear it in a different voice. So I think actually getting very about who your priority is, is the first thing to do. Because for some, some organisations that might be actually investors, it might be the city. For others, it might be actually political or local stakeholders. For some, it's actually their own people or customers. So actually those are very different and you wouldn't talk in the same way to um, the city as you necessarily would to your employees. So we often do um, audience mapping. So think about your audiences very clearly. Think about what channels you can communicate with them. Think about the tone of voice that you'll use to talk to them. And then think about the key messages people with them. I don't believe in one size fits all and so often in an issue you know somebody will come up with a key message and then they roll it out everywhere and actually there's a nuance to how you communicate with those audiences it's funny as we're seeing businesses especially particularly in our london office start to roll out messaging um, as they start to reopen and um, even from the customer messaging they've gone quite serious it's all a bit public health um, focused which is important but we shouldn't forget that actually there's a sort of brand tone of voice, which is really important too, Morna. You know, we need to be able to communicate in a way and, and, and kind of build credibility and trust. But we shouldn't forget that if you're working for a brand, especially a brand with personality, that you don't lose that entirely. Because um, I think that's really, really important too. What about, um, you know, if, if I, we've all been there, we've, we've had a really... Um, dominant CEO um, or a marketing team that absolutely quite rightly believe in their product but how important is it to challenge your own thinking in a crisis? 
I mean, having worked in-house and an agency, I think this is part of the problem, especially if you're in-house, you know, you, of course, are incredibly loyal to the companies and the brands that you work with. And you love that brand and you believe in it. And when something goes wrong, it's very hard for people to accept that. They take it quite personally. And there's a real danger in that scenario that you kind of end up believing your own hype. And you're actually not real and you're not honest about the situation you're in. So I think Andrew and I were chatting about it this week. You know, you need to be able to have some, someone who's going to challenge you, someone who's going to challenge the marketing team and say, actually, guys, this is not going to wash externally. Uh, and, and I think having somebody external is a useful, useful point for that. Definitely just endorse that. I mean, I think the challenge function of communications is really, really important. They need to be the, the lens through which the outside world speaks to the company and vice versa. The sort of, you know, you, you pick up from social media now, you know, from, from quality media um, uh, as well, because they're, they're hearing from all the other stakeholders what people are saying, and that's important. One other little shout out point, which is to watch lawyers in a crisis. If a company gets fear and gets legaled down, then it's potentially fatal. Uh, lawyers had, have had a preeminent position as advisors obviously for many years and since I think the financial crisis the communications function has become more more senior um, but sometimes you can be managing for legal risk and in doing so absolutely destroying your reputation which in turn can destroy your license to operate either with government or with others so it's really really important that you respect lawyers and you respect their position but it's just one point of view it's like ministers just now saying I'm listening to the scientists by all means listen to the scientists because some of them will agree with each other, but all, lots of them will disagree. But take responsibility for, for the decisions and the leadership of the organisation. I think comms can help with that. I think that's a great point. And also that feeds on nicely to, the, to a question I wanted to ask around who represents your organisation or your brand. And particularly if you're a brand as part of a bigger business and um, a crisis hits, how do you manage the tonality and also who's speaking for you? Should it be in a brand tone of voice or should it be the chief exec? How could you manage that best? I mean, I'm always a believer in you put the best person forward for the job. And actually sometimes that's different people for different, for different jobs and different audiences. I mean, if you've got a dream CEO, then it's easy. You know, you've got somebody who can communicate well, who can empathise, who can be honest, who can be real. And, you know, we've all had those scenarios where you're lucky to, to work with natural communicators. The challenge you have is when your most senior person is not a natural communicator. Um, and there's obviously a lot you can do in terms of media training and coaching and rehearsing back to our whole be prepared piece that Andrew was talking to earlier. But then there's also a way where we can use alternative spokespeople. Uh, managing the political part of that is challenging. But at the end of the day, to have an honest conversation and to be able to say, we believe that somebody else can do this better and it's in the best interest of the business. I think it's hard for anybody to argue that. And hopefully people can put egos aside. Easier said than done, though, sometimes. It's a good idea if you pick up on um, polling, trust polling for most organisations tells you that the closer you get to my life, the more I trust you, the further away, more abstract you are, the less I trust you. So the hard truth for most chief execs and chair, chair, chair men and women is people don't really trust you. So you're not often the best voice, although you have to be accountable, you have to stand up. So if you're, you know, if, if the front line, people who are actually living, facing clients, facing customers every day, would tend to be the ones that people trust. So the, those that are in the teeth of actually dealing with it rather than in a, an ivory tower. So that's point one. And the other one I think is, you were saying, Juliet, is just the chief exec needs to be visible, but they, you also need to keep them in reserve for escalation because if they're out, one point then everything changes and then they lose their credibility that could be calamitous so as you say horses for courses is a really good uh, way of putting it yeah, i think that's interesting from our perspective at uh, royal bank in that west so we have um alison rose as our, our new chief exec um she'd been enrolled for i guess a couple of months by the time the crisis had hit and interesting we had lots of discussions internally about whether it was right to have alison kind of front some of the key messages, particularly on more of our digital channels. So did we have, for example, Alison present some messages through our social media? There was a letter that was published, um, signed by Alison that went out into press. Um, we carried that on social as well, and it ended up being the most engaged piece of content through the whole uh, COVID crisis that we had. Um, so people are obviously very um, 
you know, receptive to a, a message from the chief exec. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things we've kind of touched on that a little bit already, but one of the key things is bringing in maybe a friendly voice or an expert as you need them. I think we've seen that definitely within governments who have brought in experts to reassure people or to bring a point to life. Um, and is that something that um, a business could continue to do as well? Would, would you advise people to do that? I, mean, I think it's I think it's a tricky one because you don't want to be seen to be putting anyone else in front of you and running away. But I think third parties can be very useful. I mean, in you know, you, when you're doing your planning and your audience planning, one of the things you need to think about are people who are going to be either upset or could support you in your in your statement. Actually, sometimes people who are potentially going to be negative in advance can be hugely useful because the first thing the media will do is they will go to somebody else for, for spokes, you know, for another point of view. And actually having had the chance to speak to them in advance can be very, very good. But also similarly to get people on site from the very beginning. So, I, you know, we're I mean, I'm a big fan of being able to make sure that you've got lots of other people to talk um, your same messages and, and support your story. I don't know what you think, Andrew. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, definitely. If you can get intermediaries, commentators, it's always first in my sort of list of things to do is to find out those that might be called on for evidence because you might have your customers going bananas or someone else going bananas at you. The company can defend, but people will be looking for some sort of interpretation around the middle. And I think that's really important. The other one not to miss is, um, and I hope this doesn't offend anyone on, on the call, but n no one really graduates from university or go to university saying, I really want to become a colleague communications expert. But in actual fact, I think having been for years, you know, less interesting amongst all the comms functions than say the, the, the PR and the media people, I think now colleague communications is the single most important thing, not least because of the democratization of the discussion. So if you can reach your own colleagues, let them understand what's going on, because oftentimes they'll be saying, I've no idea what's happening. I'm on the call center and nobody's telling us what's going on. It's all a bit of a mess. If you can fix for that, and they then broadcast, they're much, again, much more trusted than, than an official spokesperson for the company. So that's another big one, very big one, I think, to, to watch for. Another thing to do in the background is remember, you know, if you're talking about broadcasters or indeed print journalists, but particularly in broadcast, behind the interviewers that are usually, or that are always producers and editors and people who set the, the longer term agenda. So it's a good idea to have a, a relationships established as far up the food chain as you can go. And what, what certainly we did in the banking crisis was we would take, privately almost take the chief exec in. I remember one day going in um, at Robert Peston's invitation, we spoke to about 100 BBC business journalists, uh, very candidly and openly, because it was not for onward broadcast at that point. And it did a lot to establish trust around the, the sort of incoming chief exec. And I'm not saying we still got smashed every, every day, uh, not we didn't get smashed, we were smashed by someone else is what I'm getting at there. Um, and, but it definitely worked to have these human relationships established and, and a sense of understanding, which, um, which is, is, you know, if you're, if you're only just in the abstract, it's much easier to hit. Mm, that's a good point as well. Derek, when we were talking um, before this call and we were getting you know, to know each other and mm -hmm. talking about experience, I think one of the key things that you talked about was how much you, your business model and, and what you've been doing has changed um, and how agile you've had to be. Um, can you just tell us a bit more about what you've been doing? I think that'd be really interesting. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, agility is, is really key. And I, I mentioned that um, obviously we, we had our, our new CEO, uh, CEO who had not long been in post, but actually in February had just set out the new uh, strategy and, and vision. Um, and that was literally weeks, weeks before the, the pandemic really hit. So as well as that, um, our CMO had, had not long retired. So David Weldon was leaving the bank. And we, we were kind of in, in a slight, slight situation of, of you know, change in, in terms of leadership, but we had very clear plans in terms of what we were going to deliver and in terms of the marketing plans. And then as we saw um, very quickly, the COVID-19 pandemic kind of um, escalated and very quickly we were suddenly found ourselves in a position of everybody working from home. Um, any of the plans that we had had to be completely scrapped and, and rethought in terms of we had to get the right messages out to our customers about how we were supporting them. Um, and through all of that, obviously supporting our own colleagues in terms of the, the new way of working 
you know, working from home with the schools being off and so on. Um, so I think it was mentioned before about, you know, you can prepare for an incident, but you can't prepare for the, the content for that incident. So while we had in place um, processes and protocols that were set up to be able to manage incidents, we had to very quickly understand what were the key, what were the key messages we needed to get out to customers. What were customers asking about how we could help and support them? And obviously the, the biggest challenge was that we were having to, um, you know, within the lockdown, customers couldn't really get out to branch. Some of our most vulnerable customers, the customers that really needed to get to branch because that's the only way they really bank with us, we had to find ways to communicate to them as well. So, for example, the over 70s group who traditionally would use branches more than use digital or, or social or, or mobile banking, we had to very quickly establish ways to support them and get the key messages out to them. So, you know, there's a number of different things going on at the same time. And I think the, the key thing, and I think Andrew mentioned it as well about having the right um, lines of communication open in terms of to, you know, senior uh, management and senior levels for approval. So as the government were announcing these new schemes to support um, individuals and businesses, we had to be on the front foot to be able to communicate those in a timely and relevant manner through the right channels. Um, now, if you're, if you're people that aren't out and about, obviously the media mix is then changing. So, you know, you've got to get your media organization working really hard to make sure that we're using the most appropriate channels. For example, what's the point in advertising out of home when nobody's out of home? You know, are people still buying newspapers? Uh, obviously, social media was, was, you know, exploding because everybody was at home. Um, and, you know, social media is, is kind of the first place that we would go to as an organization to get immediate messages out to the customers. So, you know, from my perspective, with my team managing all of our social channels, we, you know, we were kind of in the front line in terms of just getting the messages out as quickly as possible and also trying to understand how people were responding and the questions that were being asked and so on. So a number of different challenges, and particularly if you're asking people to um, use other ways of banking like mobile and, and digital banking, if they haven't used them before, you've also got the challenge of helping them to, to get up to speed and understand how to use these services um, through channels that, that are maybe new to them. So as an example, we've created these um, live sessions where people can um, join either a Zoom webinar, so it's a, a kind of group-based session, or we've done Facebook Live events where we've actually hosted um, our experts talking about how to use the services. And we've had to do things like ask, you know, um, people to, to get their friends and family to, to look at this because they might not normally be on social to help them understand how to use these services. There was so many, you know, moving parts, I guess, and I guess from a, an agility point of view, it's about just trying to um, make sure that you've got the lines of communication open. I think within our organization, you know, as I say, processes were quickly set up, but I think one of the things you've got to do is make sure that your teams are aligned People are very clear on roles and responsibilities, very clear in terms of, um, you know, escalation routes and um, approvals, most importantly, because if we were getting told that, you know, overnight the government were announcing a particular scheme that had to be launched by the banks, you know, the next day, we obviously had to be, you know, very much uh, on the front foot and on the ball to be able to, to communicate those and using the right channels at the right time but being mindful of the responses that people are, are, um, are coming to us with on social media. Obviously our phone lines were, were, were red hot. Our social response team who, you know, we work very closely with, they pride themselves on being able to respond to, um, to customers in less than 10 minutes in a normal situation. But they saw an increase of something like three to 400% in terms of the number of people that, that were, you know, sending messages. So. You know, everybody's obviously, while they're, they're dealing with the influx, having to make sure we're, that we're responding to customers in a timely manner, um, but also getting the right messages out. So, and then obviously you've got the situation with people working from home and, and trying to create, um, you know, advertising with people being at home is, is another set of challenges altogether with colleagues that are also being at home. So, I mean, that's why we obviously saw, um, you know, a huge rise in, in kind of home shop TV ads, for example. I mean, obviously we, we were exactly the same. And then you've got the challenge of making sure that you're still getting your brand character in there, um, you know, to, 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 to ensure that while you are getting the right messages out, you're still doing it in the manner that, that you know, 
have set out as, as, a, as an organization. So a number of different challenges, lots of um, moving parts, but I think the key thing is making sure that, uh, as I say, lines of communication are open and that your colleagues understand and are fully supported throughout that as well. Because I think as we're all stuck at home and, and doing Zoom meetings like this all the time, you know, I think people uh, in terms of mental health need to be fully supported as well. And that's where, as an organisation, I think we've, um, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of help and support to, to make sure colleagues are, are really supported through that, um, which has been great. So I think, you know, Agile has been, it is about just, you know, knowing um, how to, to help colleagues do things as, as efficiently and as smartly as possible. One, an interesting question that's come in is um, whether the pandemic has forced us to do things properly because to not do it would be catastrophic, which is an interesting question when, you know, we look at having to shorten the um, time frame of normal process, the shorten the approvals process and the people who are in the know. What, what's your opinion on that? Is it forcing us to do it properly or, or not? Or to find new ways of new proper? Yeah, I mean, I think from our perspective, I mean, obviously things have to be done properly, um, you know, and, and there was a huge challenge, I guess, internally from, um, you know, looking at what was going out because, you know, it's, regardless of how quick it's got to go, it's still got to be, you know, fully approved, it's got to be compliant, it's got to be right. And, and I, I completely agree. I think more so than ever, you've got to get it right and you've got to get it right first time because if it's, if it's wrong, then that can cause, you know, a whole lot of, um, you know, more issues that, than it would solve if it's right. So, so I think doing things properly is absolutely spot on. Mm -hmm. But I think where, I think where the challenge can be is um, does it need to be perfect or does it need to be timely and authentic? And I think that's the balance. So yes, it's got to be done properly. But I think there's, there's something to be said for being more timely and perhaps less perfect sometimes mm. just to make sure that you've got the, the message out. Because at the end of the day, the most important thing is that customers are supported at the right time. So, you know, the, the phrase I heard right at the beginning was, you know, don't let the, the perfect get the, in the way of the possible. And mm. I think that's absolutely right. I think that's one of the challenges of this is the pace has been unbelievable. Mm. Um, you know, and if I think about our own businesses and our own clients and how quickly things, ha things happen, but then things continue to happen you know, it's an ever changing. So I think businesses have had to be much faster in how they make decisions, how they react. And actually, I just love your point about timeliness because there's just no point. We could, there's no navel gazing allowed. Um, people have to really be on it. And I think that can only be a good thing as we move into the future. There'll be no more of this mucking about. Decisions will be made much more quickly. Yeah. And when you can't make them, um, Julia, the, the, it's still important to be visible and to be saying stuff. So if clients are calling or customers are calling out for what's happening about X or Y, it's far better to be saying, we just don't know at the moment. Um, uh, and then we'll tell you as soon as we can. They're not seeing anything and waiting. I think being missing in action is one of the biggest single risks for companies, chief execs, and by all, also for us in the comms and marketing function and, and in agencies, if you work in an agency. One of the biggest mistakes I made early on in, in this agency that I'm working with now was um, respecting hierarchy too much. And a client was in a crisis and I was dealing with the director of communications, very close with them, it was all fine. But they were very keen that they channeled stuff to the chief exec, you got to respect that. It's one of the core tensions in an agency relationship is how do you maintain the different um, uh, political relationships in a company and we handled the crisis quite well the comms function did well and the chief exec called me and I went and expect him to be told thanks very much for all you did and I was asked where the hell were you um, <laughs> you, were, you were you were missing in action and of course I wasn't but um, you know you're watching that and that's true be present and if it takes being a bit less polite than normal with hierarchy then it's then it's a good idea I would say Mm, good point. Yeah, I think sometimes that's a benefit of an agency as well, though, isn't it? We're not, we're not subject to all that internal politics, so we can we can have that cut through. Um, yeah. and I, you know, we we're able to see things that maybe somebody else in the organi organisation can't see or is afraid to see. Yeah. Um, and see it on their behalf. I suppose one of the other things that um, you know, here we are. We're in week nine of lockdown, um, and. 
you know, it, it started out very much, we're in this together, and, but you can just start to feel the mood of the nation is changing and, and that would happen in any circumstance. How, how are we best equipped or to manage that? Or what implication does that have to your communications and your messaging if something is continuing over time? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we go back to the be prepared and I think there will be organisations right now who are going to have to make redundancies, who are going to have to pull, pull investment that they were going to make, who are going to have to change their plans. And they're probably sitting right now working through how they do that and then how they communicate that. And, and in all honesty, you could have that plan nailed. But in two weeks time, the mood or the sentiment of the nation could have changed dramatically. And I think it's a really important point is that you absolutely need to get a read on that. And that's a little bit in the media and the media do um, you know, dictate that tone a lot. And at the moment, it's about togetherness, as you said, more there's a real sort of sense of community. But there's starting to be a little bit of an undertone now from the, the press, um, which is a little bit more negative. And they're also after they've or stopped criticising the government all the time, they're going to be starting to look at who else they can have a go at. And I think business is going to come under a huge amount of scrutiny for how it behaves over the next couple of months. So I think businesses just need to be very mindful of the environment that they're, they're operating in and the tone and the language they use and the approach they take needs to kind of um, really, really reflect that or they can really get themselves in some ridiculously hot water. Mm. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think it's, it's important to really um, listen to, to your audience and to your customers. So, um, you know, from a social media point of view, we, we obviously, as I mentioned, we, we, you know, we're, we're always inundated with, with messages and, and comments on our, our social media content. But the benefit that that gives us is, is it gives us a bit of a, an instant read in terms of how people are reacting to, to the messages that, that we are putting out. And we will feed that back in terms of making sure that anything that we do is, is reflective of that, because it, you know, it is a good real-time feedback mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, I think one of the things that's, that's really helped the, the teams is, is to continue to do testing of, of the, the ads as well. Um, I know that the teams were, were testing the, the TV ads as they went out, just because, again, that's a good reflection of, you know, how does it fit with, with the current mood and the current situation. So I think it's always important to, to continue to, to listen. And although we may get pressure to, you know, put out certain messages at certain times, I think we need to, to kind of really um, push back where it's relevant and say, well, actually, we're, we're hearing this from our customers through these channels and use that as, as kind of insight to say why it might not be appropriate at this time or how we might adapt our messaging to, to suit that. Yeah, I mean, I think social listening tools that we now have, which we didn't have 10 years ago, are brilliant because we can get a real time view on what's gone out. So if we put an announcement out, we can very quickly do sentiment checks to see how that's landing. And I think actually in the, in the days gone by where you put out a press release and have to wait, you know, another 12, 12, 24 hours until you know what happened. Um, it can it can help you adapt your messaging as well. And I think if, if you are going through a crisis of any kind, I would recommend getting a social media tool up and running so that you can do very, very quickly real time reporting and then tweak your messaging accordingly um, if things aren't quite going the way you want them to. But yeah, it's actually a real gift from our point of view. Obviously, the awareness of the external factors and what's happening, you know, in the wider world is really important. And Andrew, maybe this is a good time for you to provide some insight on the likely economic impact and potential speed of recovery. And one of the questions that we've had as well is we've had a Scottish roadmap today and we had a, a kind of UK slash English roadmap last week. What's the difference between the two? And will, do you think there'll be a different rate of recovery for Scotland? Okay, um, I don't know how useful this will be, but let's try. I've got a chart which, and we're not an economic agency, but I've done it anyway because I was listening to, a couple of weeks ago, I was listening to the, um, all the forecasters say that the economy was going to bounce back in a V-shaped recovery and the Office for Budget Responsibility in the United Kingdom said um, the economy in 2021 would be bigger than in 2019 and I just thought that's completely insane. It can't be the case for a whole variety of reasons. So I put together this forecast shape, um, which we've been speaking to. And I think, you know, McKinsey's have come out with actually something similar, which is quite gratifying. Um, but there is no numbers on it and there's no dates because it's imposs literally impossible to predict. What we're, what we're describing there are four phases. Um, uh, we're in the first one at the moment. And we're hoping 
with announcements today and last week in the UK, we we're hoping we're moving into the second one where we've sort of reached bottom and things are beginning to tick. But then we go back into the, the next phases, which look like the, the beginnings of restart and, and rebuilding the economy and hopefully renewing it. We say renewal because we don't expect the economy to look like what it was before we went into the crisis. It was changing anyway for all, all the obvious reasons of inequality, climate and um, automation. And so we expect the crisis to, to accelerate that. And the dotted line is just the obvious one, which is we might lock down again and that will be very difficult for the economy. So that, that's the shape of how we see it. So we don't see the UK economy getting back to 2019 levels anytime soon. I mean, I would say, you know, unless there's a vaccine distributed rapidly, and I don't think that the chances of that are very high, although I was hearing this morning uh, senior uh, representatives of the Chinese government saying that they've got one at stage four, which means they're at the regulation stage for it, which if it's true, it could be very seismic news. So that's, that's how I see it. I think for the question on Scotland, the RUK, I mean, this is all very controversial. Politics is all heated all of the time. If you watch Germany, they're very relaxed about the fact that the different lenders go at different paces and reflect their local circumstances, the science, what their local democratic needs and business needs are at the same time. Um, and I think, you know, I think I can see within Scotland, you can see areas unlocking differentially. Why, why, you know, why would Shetland not open up if everything's contained? In Shetland, and that can be true of a number of areas, and I think that's what will happen. In previous pandemics, um, uh, at the start of the last century, um, some cities locked down and others didn't, and they just handled it according to local need, and I think that's something that we need to be better at in, in, in the UK. I'm really, really worried about the economics of all this because, as you know, Juliet was just saying, businesses are falling over. Um, I'll take that image away. Businesses are falling over, um, and they're not going to be able to bounce back. I'm really worried that when people are made redundant that they get the redundancy package because if you're an SME of 30 people and you've gone into liquidation, you don't have the money to pay contractual redundancy. So I think we're on, we're on the road to something that looks pretty difficult. I grew up in post-industrial Lanarkshire and we didn't really handle the transition of the 70s or the 80s well and we're still paying the price in many communities across the UK for that. And this looks to me to be many factors worse than, than, than that. So, so it's a very grave concern. Another sort of relatively controversial point I would make as somebody who's obviously, a, not obviously, but if you don't know me, then I am a supporter of the Scottish Government here very much so. Um, but, but I am concerned that there's, and it's to the points we were making earlier about having challenge in, in the room, who, who's standing up for jobs in the economy and businesses at the moment? Because if it's as bad as I think it will be, the inequality and the unemployment will kill many more people than COVID. So, so that's, a, that's a real concern and I'm really doing my best to try and encourage um, the business and uh, employer voice to be heard in, in, in the current crisis. And, and, and there are a number of reasons why, you know, all, all the regions and nations of the UK, Scotland could fare worse here, not least because, you know, a number of different very exposed and important sectors are, are hardest hit. So oil and gas, you know, in deep trouble, tourism, which is hugely important to the Scottish economy as an exporter deep trouble and um, food and drink uh, the, the few businesses that we've got that can export well you know into global markets like food and drink are you know deep trouble so there are many there are many reasons to be to be to be watchful of that so I think that's why it needs a really major um, cross-partisan cross-sector recovery plan um, which I know is being thought about and hopefully will be underway before too long. Another question that's coming is, um, are we doing enough to encourage FDI to continue to come into Scotland? Um, well, I can try and answer that. I mean, I think we, um, no would be the short answer because I think I think it's, you know, if, if we prove through the crisis that we're quite difficult to do business with, then I think it will make investment more difficult. That's a double-edged sword because while you want investment coming in, you also want to retain ownership of the upside of your own businesses and you want to you know, invest yourself if you like, and there, there's a lot of money in the world circulating and looking for a home. Lots of countries have got loads of cash because of oil and gas, because of big pension funds, whatever else. So having lots of British businesses bought up because the pound's cheap and, um, you know, for a whole variety of reasons, Brexit plus this crisis, that could leave us pretty badly placed in the future. FDI is always a double-edged short sword, I think. You know, it's, it's short-term good, long-term it can be bad. Not, not bad, it, can, it just means you lose control. Mm. 
But one thing you touched on there is, and I suppose we're, we're all focused on this immediate crisis and, and how we're potentially going to get out of that. But how do brands start to think, or should they start to think about the future and, and future proofing again um, in terms of um, you know, what's coming next? I mean, I think reopening is going to be very challenging for anyone in hospitality, anyone in any tourism venues. You know, I mean, it, it, it's it's hideous, really, isn't it? Because a we don't know, so you can do all the planning you like in the world, but actually, there's still so much unknown. And I think it's the kind of un, unknown piece that is giving everyone quite a lot of anxiety. As human beings, we don't like to not know. Um, but even just thinking about how they then message that. So the first thing customers are going to want to know is that are, are you credible or are, are you, can I try or go to me in any other way? And I think so the, the sort of businesses have to act responsibly first and foremost. And then once they get over that, you know, there's a whole bunch of joy with a lot of those businesses associated as well. You know, it, the whole part of going out and doing things is the experience that comes with that. And if that experience is compromised, how do you then message that? And I'm not going to lie, I think it's a really, really hard challenge um, to kind of get over is to do that kind of credibility and that security and the safety piece while also retaining a sense of kind of hope and excitement about the future. Um, but I think, you know, it, it can be done, but I think it's a big communications challenge for businesses as they reopen. That's the biggest thing for me, I think. Mm. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is is the unknown, but I mean, you've, you've got to, to plan I guess, to, to the best of your abilities. I mean, you know, as a bank, we've got to think about, obviously, you know, the crisis has, has had a huge impact in, you know, people's own personal finances, but, you know, as, as Andrew mentioned, for businesses as well. So I think we've got to, to really quickly move into a phase where we're really supporting individuals and businesses in any way we can and starting to think about how do we plan to do that most effectively and efficiently but while still taking on some of the learnings, um, I think it was, you know, from the crisis, I think it was mentioned before about, you know, be able to, to do things much more in a streamlined way. So I think there's a lot we can take out in terms of how we've worked through the crisis. And obviously with everybody having to work from home, um, you know, things having to be done quicker, more efficiently, you know, I think we've, it's almost like been a huge test and learn process as well for a lot of organizations, including us. You know, so I think just the way that we work internally and the, work, the way we work collaboratively with agencies as well, I think that there's a lot of, you know, important lessons that we can take from that, that I think, you know, that demonstrate how effective you can be. And I think we need to take that forward as we plan ahead and how we support customers and businesses as, you know, the recovery phase begins. I'll just add in that the other big one for the marketing and communications functions in planning ahead is to, is to be magnets for information and insight because there are loads of sources of highly i mean if i don't know if anyone's downloaded the mckinsey app the free money is on that that I mean you don't need to buy mckinsey there are good and bad bits of them but they are they are magnificent at distilling conversations with chief execs around the world we had their managing partner on a zoom call last week and by the way just so i don't steal it it was his idea to see next normal rather than you know, normal <laughs> so I'll, I'll give him i'll give him that but so, so that's important for the comms and marketing function. And the other big one, I think, and I used to work briefly for Martin Sorrell, and one of the, he was magnificent to work for, um, and one of the big things he would say to all of his agency leaders was, have a point of view, you know, whether it was the Olympics, whether it was you know, big issues here, there, or anywhere, have a point of view, and that really stuck with me. And I think it's really important for the comms and marketing function to be walking around with a point of view on, on the issues, you know, what's happening, what's coming, what's next. Not to be when you're asked by a chief exec, even if we're kicking back having a cup of tea, not to have nothing to say. And it might be wrong, but it will stimulate thought and debate and people really appreciate that. So whether you're in-house or an agency, make sure you're doing research all of the time, forcing yourself to think about you know, what would I say if asked about that? And I think the point of view is where we make money. That's where we um, you know, get respect and, 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 and grow our contribution. And so I think that, you know, even at a time like this, what's our point of view on staff welfare, colleague welfare? What's your point of view, as Juliet was saying, about how we reopen? What's your point of view about taking government support? What's your point of view about what you say about that afterwards? Hang on, you're paying a dividend, you're paying bonuses to your execs and you've taken government support. How's that going to look? Um, and these are the sort of things that we can be discussing. And I think the function, our function is, you know, this is when we're at our best. Crisis time is when we're 
that's what we're here for. Another question that's come in is, do you think the Scottish Government ha um, should have involved businesses more to this point? That's directed at me, I think an emphatic, well, I'm not critical of, you know, London, Scotland, I'm not critical of governments at all. I don't think it's a good idea to have retribution running at all the time because it will make leaders retreat and take decisions to cover their own, you know, potential criticism rather than do the right thing. I happen to think um, officials and senior politicians, let's just say locally here, are seeking to do the best. It's all about balance and I would very much like to see evidence of somebody in the room at least saying, you know, here is the implication for business, here is the implication for jobs in the economy and therefore for well-being. That, that's really what I would like to see more balance of it. So I've been calling in the last few days for the podiums that we see every day, one, two, three, CMO, chief nurse, minister or first minister. I'd like to see someone there speaking on behalf of business, jobs and the economy, employers, um, because I think it would force government to be thinking about it more near the top of the food chain. So I do think there's a balance issue now and I think we're going through a, a, a reset which was going to which is going to make this more important because I, like, like I say if we remember you know just look at the communities of some parts of Scotland indeed the rest of the UK now the inequality and joblessness is still killing people people are killing themselves or the conditions they've got as a result of their well-being are killing them and that's that's every bit as fatal as a virus and so we really need to focus our attention on that as well I think. And obviously we, we, we do need to focus on that and we need to focus our attention on how we're going to move out of this and, and move beyond this and I appreciate that it's a, a worrying time for lots of people um, but what about new graduates or people that are just coming into the, the market, the jobs market, it's not necessarily the best time for them. What could they be doing at this moment in time to be um, promoting themselves or, or seeing a way through it for them. Maybe it's about as well building resilience for them and how they can do that. What would be your recommendations on that? I actually think that's one of the most heartbreaking things is those graduates who've spent all those years studying to come in, come out into the big world and you know to, to come into this. Um, I, I think actually this is where business also has a responsibility as well and it's something we're talking about as an agency is what can we do not just um, for our own staff but actually for that next level of people coming into our industry um, and I think the business needs to take responsibility for that and recognise that a year lost for them is critical I mean, I think for their point of view um, as ever just being keen as, as Andrew said be a sponge for information be enthusiastic get involved we're going to launch kind of opportunities for young people get involved in business. I, think, I mean I think the rules are the same it's just the, the conditions in which they're operating in are different but I think it's really really heartbreaking for them. So just bring it back to some of the other things that you know people might want to do when they're in a crisis if, if you're a brand and, and you're in the marketing mix we're not assuming that everybody is an expert in communication but I suppose that would be one of the key things it seems straightforward but like any service getting specialist help seems essential. Obviously, I'm going to say that as an agency. I better come clean. <laughs> I was reading an article recently about how PR is having having a moment, and not that, of course, what we do isn't important because you know, as we often say, nothing in the mix get left to the end. You know, oh God, can somebody please brief these PR people? How do we forget that? That happens a lot. But I'll tell you what, it doesn't ever happen in is when shit hits the fan, and actually something really big happens because, as Andrew said earlier. When, when you're needed, you're right up at the top table with the CEO making the key decisions. But I think, Andrew, you were talking about it as well, you know, years of experience are what teaches you how to get through these. It's, it's only by kind of test and learn and, and actually being through it yourself that you can provide the level of counsel that you need. So as much as you can read a book or come to a one hour seminar from the Marketing Society, um, we're not going to be able to teach everyone everything. So, I mean, I'm obviously a big believer in external support and making sure you get the professional expertise, which is what it is. But I think that would be apparent and relevant for you too as well, Derek, in terms of, you know, changing the way that you work. You would want to have the specialist skills to deliver what the services you need. Absolutely. And I think that's been crucial for, for us um, to really make the difference in, in terms of, you know, I know that our agencies have been working extremely collaboratively, not just with us, but with each other as well. So I think the important thing um, is that they have been there you know through everything and they've also um helped each other normally 
with our brands, we, we have, you know, agencies that, that work on different brands and normally they, they would work separately. Um, but I think through this, they've worked really well together. And I think that has been, you know, a real strength for us. And I think that's hopefully something we would see um, being taken forward as well. So, yeah, completely agree with that. Well, I'm conscious of time and we're coming towards the end of the session. And if there is one more question that I'll probably save to the end. But um, obviously no one loves a crisis, um, but they undoubtedly foster or force, you choose, whichever your opinion is, um, foster innovation. What have been the biggest learnings for each of you from the coronavirus uh, so far? And what would your um, advice for businesses who want to come out of this and indeed any crisis in the best shape possible? I mean, I think that <laughs> I'll go first. <laughs> uh, I mean, so for me, I think I've, I've mentioned a couple of things. I mean, um, you know, having having everybody lined up in terms of understanding roles and responsibilities within the organisation um, and the, the sort of direct lines for things like approvals and escalation. I think that's really important to have that established right up front. You know, the working groups set up so that, you know, that there is minimal time in terms of being able to, to get something from, you know, an asset from being completed to, to being out there. Because I think we've mentioned that, you know, timing and, and relevance is, is really important. Um, I think it's important to, to continue to really be authentic in everything that you do and, and to, to really, where possible, retain your brand character. I think it's very uh, easy for that to be lost through the panic of just getting stuff out there. Uh, and that probably happened to us, you know, at, at the early stages, but I think just being able to, to just keep an eye on that and, and you know, be true to you, your, your brand character and, and authentic is, is key. And then the third point is really around um, your colleagues and, and making sure that through any crisis, it's going to have an impact on um, the people you work with and, and your colleagues. So I think we've, um, you know, within our organization, I think that's been put front and center to make sure everybody is supported, particularly with this situation, you know, everybody working from home, as I mentioned, but, you know, I think just even just on a one-to-one -one basis, looking out for each other, we've done things like, you know, lots of kind of Zoom catch-ups, even, you know, Zoom drinks on a Friday or, or quizzes or games or whatever. I think that's been really important um, to maintain that um, staff morale. Mm. I mean, I think for me, it's a brilliant lesson, never be complacent. No matter how brilliant you are, how brilliant your business is, how successful you are, anything can hit you and blindside you. And I think, you know, we've had that happen a few times in our years and it's always taught us to never, ever be complacent. But I, I agree with Derek's point. The first thing for me when this happened was our people and that there were a number of customers actually, it still remains that way now. And I think being a leader and being not afraid to kind of be honest, not afraid to show emotion, not afraid to also be inspiring when you need to be and I think that whole empathetic honest approach actually means that everyone does come with you but I also think trying to then be opportunistic and there's a point where things change there's a point where your mood changes and you realize that you're going to have to get out of this at some point so we're very much now in the kind of how do we how do we change our business how do we change where we're going to make sure that we are moving in the right direction so I think a lot of resilience built up over the last uh, nine weeks um, and the one thing I didn't know is you can actually build resilience. Resilience is something you're born with. You can you can build on it, and I think that can only be a good thing for all of us in the future. I would I would endorse all of those sentiments very much. I have to say, whilst hating the implications for everyone of any one crisis, whether it's the financial one or or any calamitous situation, professionally, I absolutely love a crisis. I think it's the most <laughs> engaging time, and it's when you can make a real difference. You know, many organisations sort of chunder along with the phrase. You know, I remember the chairman of RBS, Philip Hampton, said to me, we're, we're getting 25 years business experience every year at the moment, and it felt like that. And there's a, I'm trying to remember, there's a quote from Lenin, of all people, as in, as in the Russian the Soviet leader, which is to the effect of something like the effect of there are decades that go by when nothing happens, and then there are weeks when decades happen. And that's certainly how it feels to me at the moment. And so, I mean, I think probably the, you know, the lessons learned, I mean, one, one simple and one sort of more emotional, I suppose, the simple one is we can all work from home in our business. So we were having a real debate as an agency about, you know, people that wanted to go and, you know, 
work from home, live remotely and all that sort of stuff. And it was irking a little bit, but now it's clear that we can do it and it's fine. But the, the really important point, the research from the Resolution Foundation that the top 50% of um, pay, you know, in terms of pay, 90% of them can work from home without any difficulty. The bottom 50%, only 10% can work from home and there's whole chunks of society that can't. What are we going to do about that? What are we going to do about those the sort of inequalities that we're already making our system unsustainable? That uh, just got a lot worse. And then the other observation that one of my colleagues was saying to me, um, and again, it's amazing, I hadn't spotted it, and then if somebody just says it and it becomes obvious, which is there's a whole section of society that's been living like this forever. People who are isolated and at home that don't have interactions that, that can't go out their house, or if they can, it's rare, that, who are lonely. And I think if we give out of this a bit more compassionate than, than we went into it, a bit less selfish, I can see that happening. I can feel it just even at a grass, you know, around our communities, you can feel it. But if we can have, I was just on a call with a whole bunch of really senior chairman and chief execs earlier on today, and all of them were talking in this way, whereas before you would have had the sort of red and tooth and claw capitalist debate versus the you know, the sort of people, the sort of trendy lefty, you know, we care about CSR types. Now, now everyone agrees. And it's, um, it's, I mean, almost, almost exclusively everyone agree, agrees. And so that's one of the big potential positives to come from the crisis that we will, we will remake better, hopefully. Mm. Well, that's a great point to finish on. Thank you, everybody.